Thank you everybody for being here today. My name is Courtney Francis. I'm the Outreach Manager at Working Examples. Today we have um, Dennis Ramirez and Dan White with us. They're both um, educational game designers. And we're going to talk to them about the ways that game designers can work with people in different disciplines to create really effective learning games. Um, it's challenging and there's a lot of moving parts, so we're going to be exploring that today. Um, so let's start with some introductions. Um, what's your story, guys? Uh, I guess we can start with Dennis. He's left the most on my screen anyway. Uh, and uh, just tell us who you are, who you work with, and how uh, your organization or personal life supports uh, developing learning games. Sure. Yeah, well, my name is Dennis Remedius, and I work with Kurt Squire. Um, I'm currently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm doing my PhD in digital media here. Um, I, I have made educational games or have been part of educational games for a while. And before that, just making just games in general, board games, um, prototype games since, I don't know, since longer than I care to admit. Actually, it's awesome, so I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, so that's um, that's where I'm coming from, and the reason I sort of gravitated into the world of educational games was I started off in computer science, and there was a lot of cool stuff that they were doing in terms of predictive modeling and ways to help people, and I was like, this is awesome. These are really cool things. Why aren't they in games? And I sort of took that and also my love for cool educational games that I really had fun with and um, looking at sort of at, the, um, at what was out there and saying, we can do better. Like, we can make better educational games. It doesn't all have to be skill and drill. So that's kind of how I got here. Cool. OK. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Dan White. I'm the executive producer of Film and Games. Um, I got into this space. Uh, I'm going to give a year. It was it was 1998, um, and I was working at a place called the Cornell Theory Center, which was a supercomputing facility that had NSF and formal science had money to make virtual museums about science concepts like genetics. And what we developed wasn't particularly game-like per se, um, even though it was in a virtual world, but. Um, we would test on boys and girls clubs, 4-H clubs, and the, the kids would get really excited about these high-level genetics concepts just because we were presenting them in sort of a novel virtual environment. Um, and so even though the technology was really primitive, it was clear that there was a lot of potential there, a lot of untapped potential. So I wanted to do a graduate program at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, the same program that, that Dennis has uh, participated in. and. Um, uh, founded Film and Games while I was a graduate student in that program. Um, I worked on a project, a master's thesis project based master's thesis to build a game about um, ocean science. I presented that at a conference in Washington, D.C., then called Serious Games. It's now defunct, um, or at least it's, I think it lives on in, in, in some form at GDC. Um, but basically, the, uh, the master's thesis was parlayed into a funded project. Um, Jason project, and that allowed us to build out our first kind of fully funded educational game project, which took about a year. Uh, and uh, after that project, we built the company kind of one project at a time. Uh, we're now in, in our mid 40s, um, not in terms of age, in terms of number of employees, um, although average age is probably around there. Um, and uh, we uh, built over 60 educational games at this point. So the, the tally is, is growing every day. Um, we have, at any given time, usually about somewhere between eight to 10 projects active in the studio. Um, and every day is a learning experience. We've, we've learned a tremendous amount uh, across the games that we've built up to this point, And we plan to keep failing and iterating and, uh, and trying new things for the foreseeable future. Cool. Um, so this whole this session is about effectiveness. Um, and with all the stakeholders involved in, in these sorts of uh, game designs, can you speak a little bit to who the people are in your broader ecosystem that, that help you define effectiveness in your particular um, concepts? 
whoever wants to start. So, well, um, I, I guess I can take a stab at it. Um, I guess it depends on your point of view. Um, I mean, obviously, there are people um, who are associated with the grant that try to make sure that you're living up to whatever it is you propose. Um, there are obviously the, the students who are going to play it, and um, the outcome measures there can also vary. So it might be how well they understand the concept. Um, it, it really sort of depends on what you, what the purpose of the game to begin with. So the effectiveness is whether you want them to be interested in the field, whether you want them to sort of simulate the field and um, experiment within it, um, test the bounds, learn something specific about a mechanic. So, so again, like um, we work with with outside consultants who um, who primarily are trying to see if we meet the goals of grants. We work with students directly and their teachers to try and see how um, effective it actually is in class and what changes we might be able to make to make the games better. We work with content experts who really know the field and um, who we bounce ideas off of to make sure that not only are we conveying the, um, the proper sort of ideas that we want to convey, but also that we're not leading people towards misconceptions or something like that, or if there are any sort of glaring problems. And of course, um, we have game designers and stuff, which we bounce ideas around and make sure that it's not just a sort of cookie cutter or um, single pathway sort of experience. Yeah, it's not at all dissimilar filament. So um, once the project is in flight, we have we get as much input as we can from our customers. So that's that's teachers the vast majority of the time. Um, so we work with a teacher advisory board, which is a, a group of individuals who provide input on any projects that we have active. And then we also um, we have a staff member whose sole reason for existing is to recruit. Well, I mean, she has other non-professional reasons for existing, but her sole reason for existing in filament is to recruit um, customers to provide feedback on the products that we're building. And that's, you know, early and often is generally what we try to say. So we want to have teachers providing input up front when we're doing design and concepting and brainstorming and then uh, you know all along the way to make sure that we're not uh, veering off track as we develop and always making sure that what we're developing is actually going to be something that they can use effectively in the classroom. Um, outside of that, you know, outside of our internal controls, um, we oftentimes will have the projects validated by some third party research firm. Um, once it's completed. So that's where you can step it up a little bit. The research methodology gets a little bit more formal. Um, depends on the size of the budget, obviously. But, um, you know, for example, right now we're working with a group called Rockman to do some research on a, a set of middle school science games that we developed. Um, we have another project where we're working with Circle, the Circle group at Tufts University. Um, and and uh, the methodologies don't tend to vary tremendously from from one pilot to the next um, but um, I think that I think they are in the process of being refined right now we always kind of try to push the envelope a little bit to see if we can do things differently than just you know to have a control group that doesn't play the game and do a pre post to see what the the XC Delta was or the game intervention okay. so um, Dan you work with a sort of flip model so teachers are the stakeholders that are kind of the gateway to your company making money, frankly. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it depends on the project because Filament is kind of two separate businesses under one roof. You know, we have, we do a lot of work for higher contracts, so organizations, whether they're um, publishers, academics doing research, not-for-profit organizations that are mission-driven will come to us and contract us to build something custom for them. But then we also have our own line of internally developed proprietary products that we sell directly to teachers and schools. So in the case of the latter, yeah, absolutely. the teachers ultimately determine, you know, whether or not our products succeed or fail. And we're still very much at the, at the beginning of that venture. Um, we actually just last week um, started, fired up our first major marketing campaign to promote a new product. Um, so that's a it's, a, it's a learning experience. We're trying all sorts of different things from direct mailing campaigns to social media to SEO, et cetera. Um, on the other side of the business, you know, the customer is the client, but then, you know, ultimately the customer is 
that that client um, usually cares about pleasing teachers in the end as well. So it usually ends up coming back to teachers in some form or another. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you find that similar for you, Dennis, as far as your engagement with educators in that process, although they may not be financial stakeholders? Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because the sort of system that we have right now is a, a sort of mix where um, part non-for-profit and part directly related to the university. Um, that presents some interesting, um, interesting sort of developments there, too. Uh, we found it kind of difficult to actually reach out and gather some AAA, um, AAA talent and actually help them get on board just going through like the regular grant sort of um, process. So we found that the nonprofit sort of um, helped us because then we were able to hire people um, who actually worked on AAA games from like Raven, um, a great artist, um, AI developers, et cetera, um, that we wouldn't have been able to norm um, normally. But uh, we obviously haven't gone into, say, um, stuff like the, the advertisement or um, SOE or any of that stuff with our games yet. But that's not to say that that's not something that we want to do in the future. Um, I think it's kind of clear that, uh, at least in games learning society, we really want people to play our games. And we're finding more and more that um, just getting that information out there is a huge part of that. So uh, the same sort of techniques that um, that Dan talked about, we're looking into to actually get our um, our games and the things that we make out to people who aren't necessarily the ordinary channels that we might be able to reach. Okay. So a question that comes up again and again, I think, in these spaces, um, it's, it's related to stakeholders, but how do you sort of balance all the stakeholders' needs for these projects to be successful and educational while still keeping them fun? <laughs> Do you want to go first, Dan? Uh, OK. Yeah, sure. I can take a crack at that. Um, so I actually I have, a little, I have a little soapbox on the fund. <laughs> I'll try, try to keep short. But basically, um, you know, our perspective is that it's, you know, fun is, is, a, is a relatively innocuous word, but it's easy to crush on in the education space, and it can sometimes be positive as being in, in contrast to, to the learning, if the learning gets in the way of the fun. Um, and I think it's that mentality that oftentimes leads developers to build, you know, your classic skill and drill kind of um, sugar-coated game mechanics where the, the games are apologizes for the learning surrounding it, wrapping it in, in you know, production values, but it ultimately boils down to a multiple choice quiz. Um, so our, our perspective is, is that um, fun is, is actually not necessarily one of the goals. We're more interested in delivering an experience that's kind of akin to like going to a really awesome museum um, or watching an amazing documentary, you know, as opposed to like a blockbuster or going to an amusement park. Um, and often, I mean, our, our perspective is that you wouldn't necessarily describe them. Um, you, you could argue that they are, but it's probably not the adjective that you would use. Um, meaningful, you know, inspiring. Uh, ultimately, we want students to walk away from the game with understanding. We want them to be interested in the subject matter enough to want to go and explore further their own volition, whether that's, you know, reading a book or researching it online or engaging in a class session. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's the, the, the long answer. The short answer is, yeah, you're absolutely right. Fun, fun does matter. Um, you know, where else do you want to have a debate about semantics? I guess, you know, these are games at the end of the day. People expect to enjoy themselves if they're playing a game. Um, and I guess the thing I would say about that is our focus, our focus there tends to be more on usability because we find that if we create um, a game mechanic that, uh, or a, an interesting game system. Um, one thing that gets in the way of fun at that point is is the usability. Um, and then the last thing I'd say about that is that um, even if we make something that we think is really fun, uh, it's such a subjective thing that it's going to be different from player to player. So we we don't get discouraged if every if everybody doesn't like every game that we make. 
um, the thing that's interesting is when you make educational games, if the idea is that they're going to be used in a formal education setting like a classroom, you know, you have a, you have a captive audience. The students can't leave. They have to play your game in the classroom. Um, so I think a lot of times, you know, developers will uh, breathe a sigh of relief because, you know, it would be, it'd be difficult for a lot of these games to stand up against AAA games if students had their had the ability to choose between playing an educational game and playing a Call of Duty. But, um, you know, because we have a captive audience, um, I think we have the ability to be a little bit more experimental with the game mechanics to create. And again, we're, you know, if we succeed, it's not necessarily uh, a game mechanic that's really, really fun in the way that you would experience fun in a commercial entertainment Okay, but it may be really interesting because we may have tried something new that you couldn't otherwise try in the place. Cool. Do you find uh, that similar with you, Dennis, as far as um, balancing your stakeholders and, and sort of deprioritizing fun in a way? Um, I, I, don't, I don't like to look at it that way. Um, I'm sort of exactly like um, what Dan was saying. Um, what we're trying to deliver is an interesting sort of experience. And I think if you look at games in general, um, most of them sort of deliver on that. They have interesting choices built into them. Um, Raf Koster and some others in the field have sort of um, put out this theory that we, we love to learn. And those interesting choices and exploring those systems is actually what makes games fun in that sense, which is an interesting sort of view that we have because um, it seems to be the case that most people feel that if you're learning, you're not having fun. And that's a really unfortunate sort of um, view to have, especially because, um, because they seem to be, at least um, popularly, the popular opinion seems to be that they're in contrast. And you get things like, um, like games that are developed with sort of this idea of stealth learning in mind, where um, it's, it's sort of like, here, play our game. And then they come out, and they're like, surprise, you're learning. But we're not going to tell you that, because otherwise you're not going to have fun, which is kind of, um, kind of upsetting, I guess, in a, in a way. Because I think if you're learning about something that you're interested in, or if you're exploring a system, you usually have fun in those systems, which is pretty awesome. Um, I, think, I think the argument of fun, too, has sort of taken the life of, of its own in um, in games right now, like there's a lot of indie games that are sort of trying to deliver experiences that are really, really cool. Um, I'm thinking like Dear Esther, The Stanley Parable, different sorts of games out there um, that some people are sort of dubbing them as like walking simulators just because they're really trying to um, deliver an experience, which is interesting. And here's something where um, people might not say, yeah, like Mark was saying, like, I played Depression Quest and it was fun. Like that's not necessarily what you would say, but it doesn't make it a bad game because it, there's a lot of interesting things that go on underneath. Um, I also like to sometimes bring up this idea of like um, hard learning, which uh, which I use with caution, just because some people sort of um, use hard learning to say like, well, it's it's good for you and it's fun, and so um, that's like fun learning, where it instead it should be. Um, seen as sort of like an engrossing sort of ability. Seymour Papper um, used this where he described people using Logo who were really, really involved in what they were doing. And so they would write up a program and then it wouldn't work. And then um, they looked like they were frustrated and he, he was sort of worried about this because he wanted it to be a fun sort of experience for them. So he would ask them like, oh, um, well, are you having fun? Is this not working? And they would say, well, it, it, I, I am having fun, but it's a hard fun. So that's sort of where it came from, that gripping sort of um, idea. And with a lot of cool games, actually, there are instances where, um, where you get that sort of um, hard fun dissonance. Like if you're in a really um, hard StarCraft match, and um, sometimes <laughs> it's really fun in retrospect, but when you're in the thick of it and you're losing units and stuff like that, it can be really taxing and sometimes aggravating. But in the end, it's fun because it's a cool experience, an interesting thing to um, to work with. And um, for for most of the times that we work with content experts, um, it, it takes a little bit to um, to sort of get them there, to sort of show them, hey, these are a ton of different games, and this is what they're really good at. There's an experience there. Um, 
and you should you should explore what they're what they can do. And most of the times, if you find something interesting, fun usually is involved with that. But um, it, it, for balancing specifically, I think the best thing to do would be to get it in front of your um, your audience because your audience is going to tell you like, hey, this is fun or this is not fun. Um, and sort of balance and reiterate over that so that you can get a nice mix of, it's, oh, um, you're understanding the concepts and not simply just exploring the space um, with also, I'm exploring the space, this is awesome, and I'm getting some insight. Okay. And so along those lines of, uh, you know, testing early and often and, and those, those types of relationships that you have with people who maybe not, aren't on staff or maybe you only interact with at certain points in your project. Um, do, you, do you share your work with them frequently or do you sort of work with like NDAs and a little bit of a level of secrecy? Um, you both kind of have slightly different approaches and different models so I'd be interested to hear uh, kind of the level of willingness or practicality even in, in sharing those things. Yeah, we don't. Oh, you can go ahead, Dan, if you want to start. Yeah, we, we don't um, bother with that with teachers just because the, you know, the precedent for IP law in the game space is really quite liberal that um, it's, it's really hard to um, prevent other people from making knockoffs of the things that you do. So the, the best strategy is, is to just try to stay out ahead of the curve. Um, and it, honestly, if, if, if a teacher playtests one of our games and steals the idea and goes and develops it on their own, um, more power to them. We'll publish it for them, actually. It'll work <laughs> out great. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone else along the way that you, that you share your work with, or is it exclusively to, to kind of user test? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're actually really quite open about, about what we do, and, and I, I hope this space actually stays that, for quite, stays that way for a long time. Um, the learning game space, at least in my experience, with very few exceptions, has been a pretty tight-knit community of people trying to figure this all out, and there's so many unanswered questions, um, and uh, I think there's this sort of general sentiment that the, the rising tide carries all boats um, in this space that it, People are, are, you know, Philman included, are really open about the work that we do, um, how we do it, what the outcomes were, where the successes were, where the failures were. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody um, that has an interest in how to make better learning games and, and rise, rise this sector is an ally from our perspective. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're happy. We're always happy to share best practices. Um, with, with other people in the community who are interested in doing work in this space. What about you, Dennis? Yeah, so I, I think it's actually um, pretty much the same. We're not really worried about um, people stealing your ideas. We don't make people sign NDAs. What we really want to do is we want to make good educational games, and we feel that by um, having conversations with different people and getting it out there, getting people's opinions on it, we get to the heart of that matter faster. Um, like Dan said, it's kind of hard to really enforce some IP stuff, and I don't think that that's um, very productive, at least for our field, if we just focus on, oh, we can't show people what we're making because they might steal our idea. Um, most of the times, actually, where I've seen, um, I've seen people do similar things in games, they've actually, and this might just be like the, uh, the research sort of bubble thing, but... Um, they actually reach out to each other and want to collaborate because or they start citing their papers, reading their papers, because ultimately we do want to make um, good games that influence people. Um, for example, when I was working on Fair Play, um, Mary Flanagan sort of reached out to us because she was searching the space of implicit bias and conveying that through gameplay and mechanics. And we had some really good discussions and we got some insight um, from that collaboration that we wouldn't have otherwise because we were approaching it from different directions and then we were able to take those insights and put them in our games respectively and make them better. Um, actually, I think Mary doesn't necessarily need a lot of help in that. Her board games are just selling like hotcakes. So. <laughs> yeah, it's worth reiterating that the, you know, the whole educational games industry is still very nascent and it's really just crying out for examples of commercial success. So. 
like whenever we see a game sell, an educational game sell and make money, um, we're thrilled because that's a, that's another data point that we have in order to prove that there's actually a worthwhile industry worth attempting to build here. And the other thing is that because it's you know because we're talking about education, it's, there's there's this idea that um, you have you have content that has to get covered, right? There's there's an unlimited amount of things that need to be taught um, across the spectrum of, of K to adult education. And I can't I can't fathom a point, at least in my lifetime, where you know we put our hands up in the air and say, well, every you know, there's an educational game for everything that you could possibly want to know. A good educational game for everything. So I feel like it's just it's such a it's such a blue ocean problem right now that there's there's just really no um, room for kind of trying to elbow other people out of the space mm -hmm. or hold your, holding your cards close to your chest. So along those lines of um, kind of sharing your work, what are your experiences um, making games for, you know, formal learning spaces like classrooms, um, less formal spaces like maybe libraries and communities and then that versus sort of commercial gaming and, and games that are used at home. Um, do the stakeholders differ? Um, how do you define your goals and, and what would make those variations of games successful? I'm going to let Dennis jump on that while I re-log into my computer. I'm actually on somebody else's computer and just logged me out so I can't see anything. <laughs> But uh, I will I will be back momentarily. Okay. Yeah. So the space where you launch a game is actually um, it actually influences the gameplay a lot. Um, I think museums are a great example of this. When I was at Stanford, um, sort of working with them to create exhibits in um, in museums and stuff like that, we found when we user test that the interaction that you have with the game is usually much lower than say in a classroom setting where um, you might set aside like a half hour or um, a, a certain amount of time to work with a system. Um, in, a, in a museum space, you might have people interact with, like, uh, with the system for like a minute, pick it up and play it. Um, we're actually designing something right now for, um, for a museum in New York where people put down um, components and make fishing lures to catch fish. And, it's so far it's a fun game, but because it's going to be in that space, we try to make the interactions really concise so that people get an interesting experience right away, and so that if they want to try something again, they can go ahead and um, and try it again, make a hypothesis, etc. Um, for other games, uh, for games that are designed, say, to be played more at home or in outside settings, I think you have a little bit more leeway in terms of um, the amount of time people are going to spend with them. Um, fair play, for example, we wanted an experience. We wanted people to uh, reflect over what they were doing um, over the course of Jamal, the main character's life. So we made it a little bit longer because we wanted to take our time to um, to really convey that story and make you feel like you were in Jamal's shoes. Um, for the um, ARPA, DiARPA project that I worked on, um, Project Macbeth, it was a little bit different because that was more of a training exercise. So there was a set amount of time and you had to try and deliver an experience within that amount of time. Um, so that also influenced game mechanics because you're trying to reel in the playtime of how long it's expected and how many times someone might be able to, um, to play it in a given session. Okay. What about you, Dan? Can you hear and see us again? Yeah, I'm back. Uh, so the question was, um, uh, how is it different designing for classroom environments versus informal environments like libraries and museums? Yeah, what experience you have along that sort of spectrum of learning spaces and how the needs and stakeholders might differ? Mm, okay. Yeah, so the, the majority of what we build, we design with the intention that it's going to be used in a classroom. Um, although we've, we've built plenty of stuff that um, works just fine in informal learning environments. I think basically the way we think of it is that the, the classroom is is the choke point in that if you the classroom has has stricter requirements than any other learning environment. So if you 
if you meet those needs, um, then uh, it'll probably work anyplace else. It may just have some extra features that are superfluous. Um, so for the classroom, you know, obviously playtime is a is a significant consideration. Um, we used to try to design mostly games that could fit into a class period. We abandoned that idea because it's really hard to deliver a meaningful gameplay experience in the amount of time that a teacher has once they've marched their students down to the computer lab and and uh, and had an opportunity to debrief at the end of the session. So now a lot of times what we'll do is we'll we'll think of it like a, a five day field trip. So we'll we'll say you know there's this game that you play across the course of a week and uh, each day you are getting a little bit further into the game or you're you're focusing on something a little bit different. Um, and to facilitate that experience, we build curriculum materials around the game um, that gives this, the, the teacher a sense of what they can do with the game each day. So, um, you know, that will include things like classroom discussions, writing assignments, readings, um, little activities that they can do outside the game, or even in some cases having the students uh, design their own games about the same subject matter. Um, and those those scaffolds, we've we you know the theory is we really haven't tested this all that much, but the, the theory is that those scaffolds will make it a lot easier for the early majority teachers, which is the group of teachers that come after the early adopters, um, to uh, embrace game based learning in the classroom. Um, the early adopters, I think you can you can say here's a game, um, it's about X, good luck, and they'll figure out a way to use it and probably use it brilliantly in the classroom. Um, our hypothesis is basically that the, the rest of the market um, needs a little bit more hand-holding, um, and that's, that's why we try to build all these resources around the game itself. And I think that's, that's a valid approach regardless of whether or not you're working in a classroom environment, targeting a classroom environment. It's, it's probably less relevant you know, for a museum space or a library where things tend to be a little bit more freeform and user-driven. Um, but regardless, you know, whoever, whoever is, is implementing the, uh, the game and the learning environment, I think it's nice for them to have line of sight on what you consider as a developer to be best practice for implementing that game. Yeah, like, um, like Scott Nicholson brought up, um, another big difference is that you can have your, um, your teacher in the classroom as an ally to lead reflection, which is super important. And um, I recently talked to one of the creators of the Oregon Trail, and it was really cool to see the, the materials that they came up with because their sort of centerpiece was um, an insight into the systems that were inside of Oregon Trail so that the teacher could pick up the book, sort of flip through it, know what to expect at a glance, and, um, and know what, uh, what to expect, what they might deal with, and what to point out, which is super important. Um, it was sort of like if anybody's played Dungeons and Dragons, um, having the teacher and empowering them to be the dungeon master and to sort of um, really empower them to help their students if they get stuck or um, really help them understand things that they might not get. Um, so they might have them reflect on things like, um, in the Oregon Trail example, um, how, many, how many people actually made it to Oregon at the end and um, comparing that to, say, mortality rates on the actual Oregon Trail, which they did. And it was really cool because it um, mapped out to, like, the 50% that they actually had in the logbooks. Yeah, building, just to build on Scott's point real quick, too, I think we were big believers in the idea that games are used most effectively as preparation for future learning, a la Schwartz. Um, and, you know, the. I, we're hesitant to position games as the as the tool that can stand alone and deliver the learning experience in a, in a, in a silo. Like um, I really believe that games are really awesome at providing context and priming students to be kind of prepared to to delve deeper into the subject matter, either through you know formally in a classroom environment or on their own. Um, but we often find that when we when we try to burden the game with um, explicitly covering a, a set of learning objectives in a way that um, would translate directly to higher outcomes on, say, a, a, a multiple choice test. Um, it, it gets pretty pretty onerous, um, and we, we feel like we should be able to lean on the on the environment that is around the game, particularly after the game, um, for for a lot of that. And I also think it's important to. You know, part of the, the idea behind preparation for future learning is that the game is the first thing that you do. 
And I think it's important for, me, for it to be the first thing you do because that's the stage where you're really getting the buy-in from, from the learner. You know, maybe, it, it, again, this is a captive audience, at least in, in formal learning environments, and um, they may not have any inherent interest or they may not bring any interest in the subject matter to the table. Um, but if you, can, if you can ease them in via a game, um, I think you have a higher likelihood of, of engaging the students. I sort of want to bring up um, Portal, um, Minecraft, and um, even Pokemon as sort of examples of uh, games in informal spaces that also have a huge community that sort of builds up around them to um, deconstruct the game. And there's a lot of learning that comes out of that as well. Um, Portal, for example, I, um, I believe they were having a hard time actually formalizing the concepts. So like F equals MA or different sorts of velocity related questions. And um, what was interesting was that inside of the forums, that was, act, uh, that was actually happening because people had to talk to each other about what they had to do in a certain level. And they wanted to know more about, well, why can't I do this? Or um, maybe I should approach um, the problem in this way. And what was really interesting was that in that space, they sort of deconstructed it so that they could, um, they could not only solve the room, but help other people solve it. Um, the same thing sort of in Minecraft, where we see wikis pop up that, um, that really help other players who are new understand the space in a, better, in a much better way than they would have if they just went into it blind. Um, I think Pokemon's a great example, too, because the competitive stuff that they have on there is kind of crazy. Um, they really deconstruct and reverse engineer the whole battle system to, um, to within a certain percentage. And they do this by aggregating a whole bunch of data and as a community deconstructing and reconstructing the battle systems underneath, which are really, really cool. So um, I would say that in an, for an informal game, trying to foster something like that is probably a very important part of it too, or at least providing a space. Um, I know we haven't had too many examples of um, educational games with big wikis around them, but they're starting to pop up more. Like I said, um, Minecraft EDU and um, learn, learning with portals are pretty good examples of that, too. Interesting. So you can take a lot of cues from, from sort of games that weren't intended initially to be educational and the ways that communities can form around those things. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um. No, I was going to move on to a, a question of data. As you discuss sort of the community breaking down those kinds of things, that I think is a space where the the entertainment games may not dovetail with educational stuff. So when you're talking about user data for for minors, uh, for instance, and and how you track progress and success. Can you guys talk a little bit about whether you, you track this data, how you might engage it, and if you need to bring in experts to help you manage that process? I can go ahead and launch into that. Um, sure. Actually, a great deal of the work that I'm doing right now is actually looking at that, um, at that data that we collect. So we have a system called um, Adage, and what it essentially does is um, it logs people's actions. So where a player clicks, where a player goes, the events that are happening, what's seen on screen, and it gathers all that information into a database. And right now we're trying really hard to work with, um, with outside developers by releasing an API so that they can also include it in their games. Um, we're working hard on a Unity plugin, for example, that um, you should be able to drag and drop into your project, and then you should be able to have like one line of code in your existing code that can send back information to our servers. And we're starting to really um, use a lot of methods to go over what we're collecting in there. So we're doing some data mining techniques. Um, one of my favorites that I've been messing around with is um, heat maps of levels. So we can take all the clicks and all the position data um, that people playing our games give us, and we can superimpose that onto our levels. So we can see where people are more likely to go, where people don't really go. Um, we can also map out their trajectory through space. And that's really helpful um, for me on both the research and the design side, because we can look for bottlenecks. Um, we can look for uh, spaces of interest for the player. 
and we might be able to populate those with interesting interactions. Um, on the other hand, we can also gather data from, say, the um, post-test assessments, pre-test assessments, demographic data, and try and correlate it to um, a player's trajectory over time, which is also really cool. So we might be able to see um, cycles in how a person traverses the game space and how those might differ if you really understand the concepts um, from those who maybe don't get the concepts yet. Um, we're, we're working a lot with, say, models that have been put out before in predictive modeling, like um, cognitive tutor sort of comes into mind, where we take a lot of people, we show them the same problems, and then we really deconstruct how they approach it, whether they got it right, whether they got it wrong, and we gain a lot of insight into the learning process there. Like I said, um, we just started to really dig into that data, but hopefully we're going to get a lot more out of it because it's really exciting to see it. And um, I also want to plug that the qualitative side of things also really helps because when, when we data mine and we look at these examples and we sort of see, okay, this is a state space or this is a Markov model or whatever we do, we can infer what the players are doing, but it helps to really ground it if you can really interview the players who are actually going through it. Um, that way you can tie your theory and sort of test it or get some feedback from players right away, which I think is a good example of that um, back and forth that you need to have to develop um, good learning games. So you work um, primarily with anonymous data? Yes, yeah. Um, okay. I, I don't know if you want us to go into um, IRB stuff or how technical you want us to get into, but... Um, but if we want to collect data from miners right now, we can't. Uh, we have to make sure that it's de-identified. Otherwise, there's a lot of scrutiny. Um, for a while, one of our colleagues was trying to um, to collect a lot of Facebook data. But what people um, seem to miss and um, is the this idea that with metadata, you can actually get a lot of information from the player itself. So let's say we um, we have your Facebook information. Um, we can look at your friends, for example, and maybe some of those friends, um, we, we can infer relationships with them. And since they haven't given us consent, um, that, that's a sort of gray area where IRB should step in and say, hey, um, you're getting a lot of information, a lot of data that you shouldn't have access to, et cetera. Okay. So, Dan, how... Um how does the, the data affect uh, your game design and the processes that you have to go through? Do you track individual student data to prove learning, or do you do it in the sort of anonymous way that Dennis is talking about? I've done it differently across many, many different projects. Um, what we have found, so generally the way it works is that we'll create a dashboard and we'll pick a variety of different um, points to track and report out on that dashboard and um, in general I would say if I, if I could kind of sum up the last couple of years worth of experience I would say that um, it's very easy to, to generate an overwhelming amount of data for a teacher and then again I'm kind of primarily operating in the context of, of K-12 environment here. But um, you know, our first our first three or four passes at creating dashboards, um, we were really excited about all the things that the game could could report out, and so we created these dashboards that would let treat educators like data analysts and let them you know drill down into any individual student and, and um, get get really direct line of sight on the things that those students were doing in the games. Um, what we found now is that. Um, Teachers, um, in, in our experience, um, they, they just want some basics. Um, a lot of times, like when they're implementing games in the classroom, they're not they're not looking really to um, extract something that they can put into the grade book. Um, they're not even necessarily really needing to create a, a detailed report they can give to administrator for accountability or anything like that. They they mostly just want to know, you know, did, did the student complete the game? Um, it's kind of a big one, um, you know, how much time did they spend with the game, um, what were the learning objectives that they were exposed to um, in the process of playing. And so I think, you know, our, our perspective on the data thing at this point is um, keep it really simple, keep it really clean, 
um, and uh, tell validate what's actually interesting to teachers before you spend a whole bunch of engineering time building a really complex back-end data reporting system. I, I want to add a little bit of that. Um, so at, at least from the adage side of things, we also, um, we're also following that same sort of idea that the data that we collect um, hopefully will be presented, say, to, to the players. We don't want to aggregate or, open, I, sorry, we don't want to overwhelm the players or the teachers with um, data that might not be interesting to them, but we can use that in ways that are really in, um, that really might help the player. So I'm thinking of predictive models that you can then put in the game to give just-in-time help or um, that can modify the experience slightly to draw attention to certain things, but not in a way so that you have like a pop-up that says, hey, you should go back and read this chapter in the book, but more of a, of a natural sort of thing of um, drawing attention to to things inside of the game. Cool. Interesting. So we've got a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to turn the discussion a little bit to kind of the future of these games in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So where do you guys see education going in the future? And uh, you know, what does that mean for the intersection of, of games and education as it is now versus where it will be? Um, do you see any trends coming that might affect the work, the way that you do your work or the people that you need to include in that process? I'm to take a crack at that because I'm, <laughs> sure. I'm probably going to. Yeah. So, um, so actually, it's interesting because you talked about um, AERA a little bit before we started. Um, one of the one of the trends that I saw there, and also at GDC, is this push for um, for a lot of big data. And just like Radle said in the comments down there, um, data analytics seem to be king right now in a lot of predictive sort of things. I think there's um, there's a sort of danger in that just because um, just like the GRE sort of attempts to bucket people and um, the, the reason we sort of have an aversion to say tracking in schools, um, there's a tendency I think to over, um, over empath emphasize the information that you're getting from the data analytics. Um, ideally, I would like to see that data being used to, um, to tailor an individual's experience because there's and provide feedback, meaningful feedback. Um, I think that our teachers are awesome and they're overworked right now. Um, they have to not only think about what an individual student, um, well, what their class has, and you think about the multiple classes that they have, the multiple students that they have, and the different sort of approaches. I would almost guarantee that um, most teachers out there, if they could, would give one-on-one -on -one, um, help to students, but sometimes that's not possible. And so we don't mean to replace the teachers. What I would love to see is our games helping the teachers by providing some sort of feedback, but as always leaving the, um, the teacher at the head of the class sort of being as the DM and empowering them. That's really where I would like to see this all go. Um, I, I would also like to see games being used a little bit closer, and I get flack for this for some reason, I guess because people don't like to um, relate games to say books but I think it's really cool um, I would like to people I would like people to use games in the classroom like they do with books and sort of deconstruct the experiences deconstruct how they felt um, because that's that's the power of the medium so really focusing on what you get out of that experience and sharing that experience deconstructing it and talking about it I think is really influential just like um, say when you read great great literature and you talk about your interpretations um, what's really cool about sharing those ideas in that space is that you might have one perspective uh, perspective your classmates might have another perspective and after talking about it and looking through it um, you get a better appreciation for the for the thing as a whole so I, I would love to see games treated like that and that goes for say commercial games and on the educational game side of things I would love to see them um, serve as feedback systems to empower students and empower teachers. Great. Yep. 
I, I agree with everything that Dennis said. Um, and I'm, I'm, Dennis operates in an academic environment, so you always let the academic prognosticate first so you don't say anything stupid because <laughs> the stuff they're doing over there is very cutting edge. Um, on, on the data stuff, um, you know, I'm really excited um, about the work that's being done, particularly here at UW and you know, over at Glass Lab. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a problem that we're really excited to, for somebody else to solve so that we can license it. Um, and ultimately, what we're interested in is something that is um, robust enough that you can take a complex gameplay experience and make an intelligent statement about what the student got out of it, what the student didn't get out of it. Um, and I think that's particularly critical because with the, with the push for data right now, the, the alternative way that you're seeing that handled is people making games that act as clean assessment vehicles, by which I mean they make you know, very small games, so it's very easy to make clear statements about what a student knows and doesn't know. You know, the more like a multiple choice test, the easier it is to, to say that you can report data out of it because it's all, you know, binary, right or wrong inputs into the system. Whereas the, the type of games that we enjoy making are the more complex system-based games. And I would love for, for a group to figure out how you can extract really full assessment data out of a more complex set of interactions with a complex system. Um, so besides the data thing, I think it's um, w one of the things that we're really interested in at Filament right now is like how do you how do you move this space forward in a way that actually recognizes that the classroom context is unique. So up until this point, we've been designing primarily single player games um, that could be just as easily played, you know, solo um, at home or in an informal learning environment or wherever or whenever. And that's cool, and I think those types of games definitely have value, and we'll probably keep making them. But we're also really interested in what kinds of games we can make that specifically take advantage of the affordances of the classroom, and also now the affordances of tablets, and schools are buying up tablets. Um, so, you know, naturally that, lent, that leads us toward multiplayer mechanics to take advantage of the fact that there's a whole bunch of kids who are physically co-located in the same space for a certain period of time. So collaborative mechanics the kids are working together. Um, and on the mobility side, mechanics that actually take advantage of the students being up and about the classroom. Um, so an, an example of that is a project we're working on right now called Discussion Maker, which is a game. It's, it's, it's actually not even all that much of a game. It's more inspired by game mechanics around dialogue. Um, but it's a game that will students through the process of having small individual, small group, and class-wide discussions about a topic in order to try to resolve some issue. Um, and it's it's a kind of a grand experiment where we're interesting to see interested to see where it goes, but ultimately we think there is a lot of potential for the future of the games and learning space and building experiences that um, you know take advantage of the fact that you have a whole bunch of students who are are not only a captive audience but also physically co-located in the same space for a certain period of time. That's great. Well, I look like <laughs> thanks, Mark. <laughs> yes, everybody go go by reach with sound steam. Right <laughs> Mark gets a small commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we're we're pretty much out of time. If anybody has any other resources they want to um, put in the chat, we're going to be sending around the transcript at the end of this. Also, uh, if you want to share your email address so that people who are in the session can get in touch with you. Um, We'll send that around as well. Um, I want to thank you guys for spending some time with us. And we also really want to continue this conversation. So if this sparked any ideas or further discussion um, for attendees or uh, our presenters, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I'll type my email in once I mute myself so it doesn't sound um, crazy. But um, yeah, feel free, you know, so we can so we can keep this discussion going. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thank okay, you guys thanks, for everybody. Having.